Um, you can find me online. I'm at the JMO. Uh, professionally, you can find me at the Ruderal. Um, in my professional life, I work as a as ops, like startup scaling consultant. Um, so Madeline Ashby is a sci-fi writer and a uh, futurist. And at the end of last year on her blog, she wrote that um, her one piece of advice for 2018 is that we should talk loudly, frequently, and in detail about the futures that we want. Um, and that kind of really uh, will set the tone for um, the rest of the talk. Um, and I want you to kind of keep that in mind, that we should be speaking about the futures with everybody that you come across, the kind of features that we want, because it's important. So I may be best known. Um, I, for my sins, coined the term stacktivism um, earlier this decade, and um, have been interested in infrastructure and politics and what it means. Um, and kind of the thing that I perhaps am most known for tumbling out of this project uh, is the term, who owns the means of not dying? Um, and that was kind of one of the, my principal concerns um, kind of that falls out of, of infrastructure politics and how we um, think about technology. I'm also one of the admins on solarpunks.net, um, which is a, uh, if you don't know about solarpunk, it is an emergent sci-fi genre, um, which looks to um, imagine a bright green, um, non-dystopian future for everybody. Um, right now, um, I'm working on a research project called Landers Platform, um, which is kind of looking at the critiques that are currently being um, applied towards platforms like Google and Facebook as platforms, um, and taking the logic of the critique of platforms and applying it to LAN. What is the logic of a platform as opposed to what we think about platforms being as like a multi-sided market kind of thing, which is what we kind of currently understand platforms in 2018 to be. But if you say the word LAN as platform, I think you, you can kind of conjure an idea about what it is that uh, we're seeking to, what I'm seeking to write about. Um, and this is probably the first outing of Landers Platform kind of as uh, a few fractured thoughts in this talk. So first of all, I want to talk about short-term thinking. Um, who works in tech? How many of you have two-week sprints? How many of you work on quarterly goals? A couple of you. Everyone has yearly goals at their companies, right? Um, well, when we think about short-term thinking is how short-term is short-term, because if you plant a tree, like an oak tree, it takes 100 to 120 years for an oak tree to be fully grown. So anything between the point in which you plant the tree to when the tree is fully grown is short-term thinking when we, when we speak about land, um, because we have to pass through that period. And Talking about 100-year timescales for, for planning um, is not something that our culture is very good at, but we need to do that. So given that it takes 100 to 120 years for a uh, an oak tree to reach full height, what does it mean when most of the atolls in the world will be uninhabitable by the mid-century? So we have 50 years until the waves take the islands. So we already have planning for 100 years but we have climate disasters within 50. So just framing the kind of concepts and the amount of time that, we, it, that these things take is uh, important to get a handle on that. Speaking in more longer terms, in terms of deep time, this is what 8,000 years of agriculture will do to a landscape. Does anyone know where the lowest plateau is? Anyone know? This is China. This is where they, uh, the, terrac the terracotta warriors were found, um, and it's where the Han Dynasty began. So if you farm a landscape for 8,000 years, it ends up looking like this. Um, an interesting fact, I'm sure you're all, if you know about Petra in the Middle East, Petra did not desertify because the climate changed. It desertified because they cut down all the trees and changed the climate. So what do we do about this? Because these are man-made environments. So this is an example of what's going on. Uh, this is from a picture from last year. And as you can see, they're, they're planting these basins on the hillsides. So when it rains, the water um, tumbles down the hills and fills up the basins and is captured and then slowly sinks in um, once the rain stops. And there's a tree planted in each of these, um, in each of these basins. So it might not look very impressive, but given the right amount of planning and time, this is what you can do to a landscape. 
So this is the biggest landscape regeneration project ever attempted by humanity. Um, and it's still very much short term, even if it does look regreened, because trees take 100 years to grow. It looks better, though. And I'm kind of down for that um, as, a, 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 as a plan. But these aren't the only projects. There are bigger ones. There's the Nile River Basin, uh, the NBI project, which is to restore, which is going to be restoring um, all of the watersheds that feed the Nile, improving water quality, frequency of flow, reducing, um, re reducing um, desertification up land, and also making sure that Egypt um, gets its continual flows. As part of this project, they will be removing dams um, from the Nile, um, and it's uh, it is already in progress, the stuff that they can do, but there's a lot of planning that still needs to be done in terms of how the project gets rolled out. So that seems like a big project, but there is even bigger projects than this. The Great Green Wall of Africa project, which is the single biggest plan right now. Um, it is a length of about 7,500 kilometers, and the area in question that they are hoping to re-green to prevent the Sahara from desertifying further is 11 million hectares of land that is being planned and re-greened. As part of both of these projects, Ethiopia, as part of the Eden project, has already re-greened one-sixth of its landmass. So um, from the left to the right. Um, and these projects are happening now. And I think it's really important that those of us that don't know anything about this do, because this is very much what the future is going to look like. These are not natural spaces. These are now anthropogenic spaces. Humans have designed these spaces. But in order to design these spaces, we need to plan it. And uh, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of uh, a thing called keyline design today, which works very much in Europe, where it has rolling hills um, and not so many mountains. So this is a map. You can see the fall running from um, the highest to lowest. And to find a key point, it's the location where a primary valley uh, emerges from the side of a hill and begins to flatten out. So if you can imagine rocks falling down a hill, at the point in which rocks first start to stop falling down a hill and land, that is a key point. And if you want to find a key point, if you'll hold out your hands like this and press your finger up between your finger and the middle finger, you'll see a little dent in your skin. That is the key point. It's the, like a pond, essentially. It's the highest point in the landscape where you can hold water. Does everyone get that? So we can identify a key point in the land. And then the, uh, uh, what's it called? On contour, the, the contour line becomes the key line in the landscape, which means it's the highest point in the land that can hold water. And once we've found a key point, we can then abstract the idea of valleys and ridges and actually define where does the valley start or the valley will start and where does the ridge end um, which if you were standing in the landscape is quite hard to identify like where where are the walls of the valley where it shifts from being a ridge to a, to, to a dale let's say um, so we can identify these two different types of land uh, of, of like level in the landscape ridges and dales um, and then we can extrapolate out into a much larger map. So you can see here that there's a primary valley, and then there's a secondary valley, and you have the red line, which is the key line that runs through the landscape. What you can then do is that you start to draw parallel lines on the landscape, both vertically up the hill and down the hill from your key point. And then there's various things that you can do. Um, it basically gives you a logic for laying out the land. You can plant trees on these lines. Or um, you can use a thing called a key line plow, which is basically a T-shaped plow that goes into the soil and explodes the subsurface. So when it rains, the water runs into the ground and is soaked, in to the, um, uh, soaked into the soil. And what that does is means when it rains, you can see the directions of these arrows, and it means that the water will run from the center of a valley out to the ridges. It's not running uphill but it is running out to the ridges, and water that lands on the ridges will flow into the valleys, which means that you get a, fully, um, a full coverage of water into a landscape, and it's far more efficient than just letting the rainwater run down the valley. 
um, and cause erosion. And then we extrapolate further, and you end up with, you know, at a high level, a key line plan for the landscape. Um, key line also uh, allows you to dictate where you can put roads um, in order to, to um, best prevent erosion and like water movement through the landscape. Um, but essentially, if you were looking at maps, this is a key lined plan for the landscape. Um, but you can zoom in, and this is an actual key line plan for a farm. Um, so if you were to like zoom in on Google Maps, obviously it's like a fractal landscape because you will find smaller key points within landscapes. So you can see here this landscape has got designations where they're going to be growing trees. It's the yellow. Um, you've got the key line rip lines, which is the blue where the water is going to go. And you can also see they've got um, places where ponds will naturally form from rainwater. Um, and th these are known as pocket ponds rather than large ponds. So you can lay out, if you've got a couple of acres, you can lay out your landscape to best optimize water flow. This is the first key-lined landscape um, from 1965. P.A. Yeomans is an Australian, was an Australian farmer who invented key-line. Um, and you can see here that um, there's all the dams on the landscape holding water um, and allowing for like flood irrigation and stuff like that. But what does it actually mean to talk about a landscape that has been designed in this way? This is New Forest Farm in the States, and this is what a key-lined landscape looks like. I think it looks pretty cool compared to square industrial farming fields that we kind of used to. Um, this is a key-lined landscape, and it's kind of what the future is going to look like, I think. So on the inverse, in the very short term, kind of what, what's technology bringing and what does, say, the next 10 to 15 years look like in terms of technology? Well, they're in the audience today, but there's Terra Zero, who are based here at Trust, um, and they are a blockchain startup that attempts to kind of wrestle with the question, can an augmented forest own and utilize itself? And behind here is the grow wall for their, their test. Um, their test test stuff that they'll be doing. Uh, maybe they can speak about that a bit later. Um, but in order to think about a forest that is going to utilize itself, it needs a lot of deep sensing data in order to inform its decisions about, um, or we need deep sensing data in order to uh, inform the decisions that we, that we need to take about the landscape. At the moment, you've got stuff like this, um, which is a, um, a soil moisture sensor from Open Hardware. It's two AA batteries, um, very cheap if you buy them in bulk, but they still require batteries. Um, there's also carbon sensors, soil pH testers, moisture testers, all the various things that you would expect um, coming out of the open hardware movement, but they're all individual sensors that require batteries at the moment. Um, there's also things like this, which is the eBird monitor, which can be placed around a landscape and give, um, uh, plotted on a map. These things can record over a million hours of, of, um, of sound. And then they run it through machine learning and can identify biodiversity of um, birds in the landscape because like, the machine learning listens to the bird song and can extrapolate how many birds there are in a certain region, etc. cetera. Um, again, they have to be powered, um, which is a bit of a problem. Um, so we need to start thinking about how do we bring all of these various sensing devices together um, and what does it look like uh, when we do? So we've kind of reached a point in 2018 where the, we've reached the end of general purpose computing. If you're not familiar with the term, then Cory Doctorow wrote a, wrote a fantastic essay in 2012 um, about the end of general purpose computing. And you can read the danger up the top. Um, basically, it's the idea that you can't run code on a device unless it's either signed or, um, uh, or you have permission to do so. Um, some of the practical implications of this is like self-driving cars can only run code that is signed because you wouldn't want people, you know, installing modules onto self-driving cars and deliberately driving into people rather than avoiding them, for example. The second part of the end of general purpose computing is a thing called ASICs. Does anyone know what an ASICs chip is in the audience? Hands up. All right. Not, 
not that many. I'll, I'll try. I'll seek to explain. So an ASICs chip is a chip that is only designed to do one thing. So it doesn't run code in the same way as we would assume code to be run, where you can just run all, all sorts of computation and code. An ASICs chip will only run what it's physically designed to run. And in 2013, this is the Butterfly Labs Bitcoin mining rig. Um, it was one of the first kind of um, drives forward in the ASIC space, in the open source ASIC space, um, because all, of the, all, all that these chips did was mine Bitcoin. They couldn't do anything else. Uh, they modified GPU chips. But what's that, what it's meant in these kind of pushing forward of chip design is that we now have things like this, which is Google's TensorFlow. Um, these units only run neural nets. So if you're doing machine learning, they don't run any other code except the code required to train neural networks. Um, advantages of this is that the code only runs on the chips. It also means you get a massive power, um, power saving because it can only do what, what you're asking the chip to do, and it doesn't have all of the overheads of, of trying to do computations um, in a general way. It's very specific and targeted. One of the other places that you'll find ASICs chips everywhere is inside mobile phones. And it's very unclear where iOS on your mobile phone ends and the hardware begins. So for example, all of your MP3s, MPEGs, JPEGs are all decoded in hardware on tiny chips on the motherboard, not in software. So um, those tiny chips only decode video, for example. Um, and and this, is, this is what is also driving the ASIC space, is the miniaturization of mobile phones. In the early days of SolarPunk, um, there was a, a, a talk given on low or no power computing. So as you can see here, there's like a soil clock. I'm, always, I'm sure you used to make potato clocks as a kid, but you could power a potato. Well, you can also do the same thing with soil, and you can run devices from soil. So what does deep sensing devices look like when they're that low power that you don't need to have a battery is a question. Um, can we get there? Maybe. But um, we need to have a think about if we're going to be deploying all of these sensor devices on a landscape, um, what does it kind of look like? How often do you have to go change a battery? If you've got 30, like 30 hectares of land, there's no way that you want to go walk or get on a quad bike to go to the other end of your land if you're a farmer to change the battery in a sensing device. Um, because that's like, if, especially if it's like once every six months, that's madness. People are too busy on farms to be, to be changing batteries in devices. So when we try and put these things together, the idea of land as platform and deep sensing, what does it look like? So I heard a bit of uh, one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. I heard the other day at a uh, blockchain conference where someone said that the invention of the blockchain is our generation's pyramids. But I would like to contend that the triumph of our civilization with ASICs chips and so on and so forth is that we will teach minute bits of mountain into thinking with captured lightning because they will be thinking machines at that point, not in the way that we perceive thinking in terms of AI, but it will literally be a slab of materials that only do one thing and they think and they give us sensing data. But what do these devices look like? Well, I don't know if you uh, make music, but there's like pallet gear is probably like the nicest design objects out there. These are MIDI controllers um, that you can just clip together and like build a, build a board of all of your different uh, MIDI controllers. So I'm imagining that sensor platforms or deep sensing platforms will be one platform that goes in the ground and then you can just connect modules on depending on what sensors that you want. Um, and obviously, when you uh, put a sensor on, you're going to have a, a deeper power load on the particular sensor. So the eBird installations kind of look like this. You can't really see the, the map, but you can kind of see how it works. So at the moment, it's all powered by base stations. Um, and each one needs to be powered, and there's like Wi-Fi networks that then ship all the data backwards and forwards. Um, and because they know where they are on the landscape, they can also triangulate where the birds are on the landscape. So one of the applications of this, and why I'm here speaking at peer-to-peer -peer web, is mesh networks. What does it look like when we start to think about connecting or planning for sensor data with mesh networks? 
um, that allow for uh, much smoother communication routes um, in terms of its information. What happens when mesh networks start thinking in terms of land as platform? And this is where I feel like I went off the deep end a little bit when I was making this slide, because it kind of looks like art rather than a diagram. But the idea here would be mesh network protocols have to have an understanding of how we're going to be laying out the land. Because if that's where I live, there's no way I want to go all the way up there to change a battery in a router. So how, does these, how do these mesh networks work in the landscape? How often do they ping each other? How often do they pass information through the mesh? Um, how often do you even need information from certain sensors? Is it once a week? Is it once a month? Um, all of these things can be baked into the power considerations of how mesh networks work. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's the, the final slide. Um, that's Landers, kind of the Landers platform. Thanks.